so hello everybody and welcome uh, and thank you for tuning in uh, on YouTube to this uh, panel event up slash root democracy uh, a seat for nature um, this is a collaborative research project between frame and framed and network democracy and it's supported by Europe direct so this online program um, focuses on extractive systems and undermining human, uh, that are undermining human and non-human rights. So looking for a potential balance for legitimate, ethical and sustainable systems in the Anthropocene, we need to consider new forms of political representation and legislation and to re-politicize extractivism in its different, in its different guises. So Uproot Democracy showcases the work of researchers, artists, activists amid an intersection of crises. And this program delves into how systems of extraction, digital, mineral, uh, nutritional, et cetera, can be a force for us, um, um, which can be a force for or against democratization. Um, so as a society, um, we're heavily dependent on the exploitation of natural resources, overproduction and overburdened eco ecological systems. And there's an urgent need for a renewed attitude towards the soil, the oceans and the living and non-living actors with whom we're sharing the planet. So this session will focus on alternative ways of farming, of consuming and of representing more than humans, which can bring forward new possibilities for the democratization of these processes. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome uh, the invited panelists, the Soft Protest Digest Inland, um, and um, with inland Fernando Garcia Dori and the Embassy of the North Sea, Anne van Leeuwen, who will discuss their practices with us. So, ranging from our gardens to the bottoms of the oceans, their work explores emerging understandings of human and non human cooperation, so ops. Um, the use of fiction and storytelling as a means for environmental justice an alternative representation for policymaking. The question we would like to raise with this panel is what attitudes and tools should we adopt as we restore equity between non-human organisms, anthropocentric systems and natural landscapes? How can we um, give a seed back to nature? It is also worth mentioning um, that the program is shown in the run-up to the project, the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, CICC, um, which is by writer and lawyer uh, Rada de Sousa and visual artist Jonas Stahl, which uh, will be presented at Frame of Framed in the fall of uh, 2021. Uh, in this tribunal, human nature right offenses of the present will be held accountable for future generations. And before I um, go on to present our panelists, I would also like to introduce myself. So I am Cecil Marie Tan. I'm a Danish artist living and working in The Hague. Um, and I'm particularly excited about being part of this conversation because it's themes that I think about a lot in my own work, um, which is generally an attempt to try to trace the complex ways that we're entangled with our surroundings and an attempt to enhance a sense of um, what Timothy Morton calls an ecological awareness of the massive scale at which techno-capitalist extractive processes have transformed our, our landscapes, but also our bodies and the bodies of other species. And I'm particularly excited about the prospect of discussing the use of storytelling and of fiction as a means for environmental justice which are tools that I have myself explored when approaching the uh, often rather depressing topics um, of what could broadly be termed uh, persistent hydrophobic chemicals and particles. And in my work more specifically, um, the presence of PFOA, the distribution of PFOA and of microplastics in the, in the landscapes and in our bodies. Uh, so these are the kind of chemicals that be exist beyond any kind of uh, imaginable time spans for, for humans and which are so ubiquitous that it is really hard 
for them and uh, for us to not think uh, through the realm of for instance science fiction so um i'm really excited uh, to be part of this conversation and um and hope to gain a lot of of great insights. And I wanted to end on um, with a small quote that uh, I found in, in a book that uh, has been incredibly dear to me for a really long time, The Mushroom at the End of the World by Annette Singh. And in her uh, chapter, Arts of Noticing, which is partly about uh, the uh, incessant uh, rhythms of progress, she quotes Ursula Le Guin. Um, and Le Guin says, I'm not proposing a return to the Stone Age. My intent is not reactionary, nor even conservative, but simply subversive. It seems that, that the utopian imagination is trapped, like capitalism and industrialism and the human population, in a one-way future consisting only of growth. All I'm trying to do is to figure out how to put a pig on the tracks. So... Um, in the name of putting a pig on the tracks, uh, I would like to introduce to you the first panelist, Anne van Leeuwen. Um, Anne van Leeuwen has initiated new symbiosis to work on a fundamental and regenerative integration of nature and culture. She studied art history, cultural analysis, and a year of biology. In 2013, she worked at Artes on a museum about the relationship between man and nature in the Anthropocene. Later, she's worked as a content, develop, uh, content developer, project coordinator, uh, chair of the art committee, and member of the Artes Kring Advisory Committee. Since 2018, she's been the board member of the Embassy of the North Sea. She researches and builds together with scientists, artists, and policymakers new ways of representing non-humans and the relations between human and non-humans in and around the North Sea. In 2020, she founded Bodemsicht, a soil perspective in Dutch, a regenerative demonstration farm and learning um, with her partner, Ricardo Cano Mateo. So Anne, please uh, take it away and tell us a bit more about your practice. Yeah, thank you, Cecil. <laughs> All right, I'll start immediately with sharing my screen and I hope you can all uh, follow that. So you all see a full screen presentation? Great. So yeah, I would like to tell you today something about the Embassy of the North Sea shortly, of uh, which I'm a board member, and also uh, of my, about my regenerative farm, Bodemsicht. So the Embassy of the North Sea was born, of course, from the reality of the Anthropocene. So it's, it's uh, as much about a new practice as, as about embracing and working out a new worldview, a new ecological reality of working and thinking based uh, on many thinkers, but also on uh, the thoughts of Bruno Latour. So we were founded in 2018. I have to see. We were founded in 2018 here in The Hague um, as, a, as a true embassy. Uh, because we felt that like the current democratic means we have do not face up to the challenges that we are actually experiencing. And of course, I'm referring to climate change, social inequality, biodiversity loss and political polarization. So most of these problems, as we see it, are born from a fundamental crisis in representation. In which not only human minority groups are not properly represented, but in which non-humans are not even considered to be part of society or of our politics. So other beings and landscapes are, of course, now mainly represented by nature organizations or uh, lobby groups for nature. But the question remains, how effective is that representation actually? So despite uh, the existence of so many of these groups, biodiversity uh, is still uh, declining abominable. Since 1970s, so we lost 60-70% uh, of life on Earth, which means that we are actually now living in the sixth mass extinction on Earth. And the question is, who is responsible for that? The problem is that humans and uh, politicians are accountable uh, to each other, but not to non-humans. 
So for example, here you have the uh, MS, uh, MSC Zoe uh, shipping disaster that happened at the islands in the Netherlands. So 345 containers washed overboard. It was a uh, uh, serious consequences for life in the North Sea, but who can file a complaint? Who is actually compensated? The non-humans find themselves always at the short end of the stick. So we think it's time for a new kind of political represent rep representation. And, and that's why we started the Embassy of the North Sea. Uh, this is together with Thijs Middeldorp, a cultural campaigner, and Harpo at Heart, uh, a composer and sound artist. And we started from three uh, starting points. Diversity of life, one. Diversity of life is in the interest of all of life. Two, non-humans should therefore be politically represented. And three, the sea owns itself and should have the right to self-determination. We put a long-term dot on the horizon that we are looking uh, into whether the North Sea should actually be its own legal person. Uh, this is, of course, already um, this is related to the rights of nature movement, and we're also working with frontline jurists on this topic. As happened, uh, for example, with the famous example of the Vanuatu River in uh, 2014 in New Zealand, which after 150 years of Maori struggle finally became its own legal personhood and is represented by guardians. Uh, so yeah, for a long time, people thought that we were the only actors uh, on earth, we as humans. So that the object objective world of nature was something fundamentally different from the subjective world of culture, the world that was supposed to write only history. Therefore, because we envisioned nature as a passive background, we could also very easily explore and exploit the realm of what we call nature. But reality has caught up with us. And now, as we've entered the Anthropocene, we can see, and I think climate change is one of the most beautiful examples of, it, of this, how interwoven nature and culture are to the point when you cannot even make um, a, a division anymore. Ironically, the Anthropocene is called the, the uh, era of man, but it's not only a time in which humans have become a geological force, but I would say and argue that's above all a time in which humans have become known, um, have become aware of their interdependency. So now we know that icebergs actually form our shores, that insects uh, co-produce our agri agricultural production, and that microbes uh, define my mood. So you could say that today we stay on the, on the, today we stand on the same stage with thousands of actors. There's no longer a cultural foreground and a natural background. The stage has collapsed. Nature is no longer a decorum. It exists no longer outside of us. And we are now sharing the world stage with 99.99999% of life. Of course, this thinking no longer exists and we didn't uh, come to this insight on our own. A lot of indigenous communities already have had the insight for centuries that humans and nature are inextricably intertwined. And recently Western thinkers like, for example, Bruno Latour uh, has come up with contemporary, um, with contemporary explanations of this ecological entanglement and how we could possibly translate that into politics. In We've Never Been Modern, he uh, spoke about the parliament of things. And actually, you could say that the embassy of the North Sea is a case study of this parliament of things. So this is a parliament in which natural and social phenomena are no longer seen as separate objects or discourses, but as hybrids that come together as an interaction between humans, things and concepts. So with the embassy, we are interested in what the sea does and not in what it is. We research and build together with a collective interdisciplinary and growing collective of philosophers, uh, marine biologists, uh, jurists, policymakers, architects, journalists, to create a sensitivity and a public consciousness of all the unseen and unheard political actors in the North Sea. And we do this in the first three years of our lives, uh, of our embassy life, uh, mainly through situated listening. And at the heart of this uh, listening is a method, and here, Cecil, I think we have a, a clear connection, uh, by the thinking also and writing of uh, Annette Singh. So she, has, uh, she also sees listening as, as, a, as a potential political method, you could say, 
She writes, to listen and to tell a rush of stories is a method. And why not make a strong claim and call it a science in addition to knowledge? Its research object is contaminated diversity. Its unit of analysis is the indeterminate encounter. To learn anything, we must revitalize arts of noticing and include ethnography and natural history. To listen properly to non-humans from our perspective cannot be done without the arts and the sciences, without imagination and representation. So what we are actually doing, that to give a clear example, we are now working on three case studies. Together, uh, we, we put together artists, scientists, and storytellers. Uh, one of the teams is working on um, the, the representation of the European eel uh, as an Amsterdammer in Amsterdam and mainly focuses on uh, city infrastructure, policy and biodiversity loss. How can we make the city uh, more of, uh, of a welcoming place, uh, a home for the European eel? A uh, second uh, team we have is the future of Delta. Here you see Teun Karelsen, who tries to be seaweed. Um, and that's actually uh, focusing on the Delta works and coastal protection. How can we move towards a more inclusive coastal protection scheme, which means also inclusive for non-humans? And what are the most important agenda points in negotiations between humans and non-humans in an open Oosterschelde? The third one, uh, we are looking into underwater noise in the North Sea. And we are looking here with more scientific focus, how is actually our non-human interests represented in scientific research. So to get a more ecological understanding, we have to listen more diversely and with a focus on interrelations. So this means we should only use our uh, ratio, but also art, poetry, and embodied knowledge, because we have a lot of knowledge available. We need to be creative in use and develop as many instruments as we can. Think of hydrophones, microbes, algorithms, but also artistic interventions, North Sea specialists, critical design, all kinds of options uh, we have there to observe our multi-species world and to imagine different relations with the sea. Of course, the question remains, how do you properly, effectively listen to non-humans? And I think whatever the answer is, it will ask seriously a lot from us. We have to be creative, ingenuitive. We have to be able to embrace new kinds of worldview, acts of empathy. But I think it will also be very alienating. Because how do I listen properly to plankton, right? So even though there is a risk of anthropomorphism, I think a bigger risk is always paternalism, that you assume that you know what is good for, uh, for another uh, being of group or community without having listened properly. So in the Anthropocene and ecological times in which we're living now, it is finally time for us to listen to non-humans and reinvent politics as a relational practice. So that's what the embassy is about. Now we'll very shortly tell you something about Bodemzicht because my time is probably running out. Um, that is the project born from love from the sea. This is a project born from love for the land. Uh, so this is me and my partner uh, Ricardo Cana Mateo, a Spanish biologist, and we started uh, last year our regenerative, regenerative farm, demonstration farm and learning place, I should say, Bodemzicht, near Nijmegen in Nederland. So uh, we started um, uh, mapping out a sort of set, this is not a model, this is a set of regenerative principles, which we think could be applied in different contexts in agriculture. And uh, we, um, uh, we are leasing a, a piece of uh, nicely degraded uh, conventional agricultural land. So it's uh, five and a half hectares in total. And um, we reimagine this place as a, a, a silver pasture system, which is actually all about uh, rebuilding topsoil as fast as we can and increasing diversity as much as we can to come up with a farm system that's fully based on abundance and resilience. Uh, this is a picture of our no-dig market garden. So we have a market garden with vegetables where we, uh, we, where we don't plow, we don't even uh, schoffel. This is something that Dutch people really love to do, like with a small plow, you could say, <laughs> go through the garden the whole day. We don't do that. Why not? Because it's all about uh, the mycelium, the fungi in the soil. Um, and uh, the more mycorrhizal fungi you have that can live in symbiosis with your plants, the more uh, resilient and uh, productive your plants uh, will be. 
So this system that we're uh, we're using is also based on a farming system that is uh, developed by this, the Swedish farmer Richard Perkins. And he has, he has a fantastic farm that is also a realistic alternative to current farming because actually you can produce more per square meter than conventional farming. So it's not only quality and it's not only reducing pesticides, but it's uh, it's creating more produce. So this came last year from the soil. This is the biodiversity that already um, started happening in the garden and it will only grow, increase more because our mission is literally to facilitate life. Um, these are some happy people working in the garden in the summer. Um, and these are chicken mobiles. So we, we build our own uh, custom designed chicken mobiles uh, so we can start with our holistic plant grazing. Holistic grazing is all about uh, moving your animals in, in a way that you mimic uh, actually the co-evolution between grass and grazers so that grass can express itself fully. Grass is supposed to be one meter high, but uh, you never, uh, almost don't see that anymore in, uh, in Europe. And uh, with deep roots that leak sugars, and actually that's a very fast way to sequester carbon out of the air and to build uh, uh, fertile topsoil. Uh, so we, um, you can see that here a little bit. So this is a, a photo made on one of the, uh, the warmest summer days was 41 degrees, but you can still see uh, the squares and where we came from near the wood pile that it's, um, you see a more green fields than uh, the, the later patches and uh, it's doing very well. We started a half a year ago with the holistic grazing and we had 50% of bare soil and now we're completely covered and the grass has come back super strong and diversity is increasing a lot. So you can really see the impact very fast. Uh, oh yeah, the, here you can see the impact. It was April uh, 2019. Uh, we took over the field in the autumn of 2019, and this is uh, last uh, year. So yeah, uh, we also uh, we are a learning place. So we also have a lot of people coming over. We're a, a network point in connecting to share our knowledge of regenerative farming, but also of regenerative insights, uh, because it's as much about worldview as it is about practice. And um, yeah, that was my uh, story. Thank you so much, Anna, for that uh, incredible journey through your work. There's uh, going to be so much to talk about, I think. And I think um, from um, your propositions uh, for empathy for, lis for listening to um, other voices, other forms of knowledge, and um, this, this uh, also this uh, desire to um, create biodiversity in the ruins, perhaps, of conventional farming landscapes. I think that um, segues us uh, very nicely into uh, our next presentation, um, which is um, the Soft Protest Digest. Um, the Soft Protest Digest is a multidisciplinary research collective involving Danish farmer and artist Nikki Sigurdsson and French designers and researchers Robin uh, Bantigny and Jeremy Rangian Lando. I hope my French pronunciation was okay there. <laughs> uh, centering its research around food history, agriculture, and the social and political ties to what constitutes a food culture, uh, the collective aims to design environmentally resilient diets. The Soft Protest Digest believes in the usage of storytelling as a way to create or adapt food traditions, recipes, and diets which would take into account the cultural heritage and emotional bond between the eater and its local gastronomy. Engaging with the community through eventful meals, workshops, and talks, the collective seeks to encompass the knowledge and resources of the actors at hand in the production of a vernacular food culture in order to design consistent alternatives. So please take it away, Nikki and Robin. Yes. Um... First, uh, actually, that, that is the text on our Wikipedia, which is uh, represented, and I'm just going to share my screen as well. Um, what do we do again here? Um, it's, in fact, a, a bit of 
like it's the text we wrote in the beginning of this project when we started uh, three years ago and our our aim at that time or our interest was really like um yeah what what role does diet play in in a more equitable uh, food system a more just and democratic food system can we change our our uh, food ways through food and through dietism and in fact we haven't really changed this uh, introduction but i think our conclusion today or not conclusion but our our approach today is perhaps uh, somewhat different um in a way, like we don't only believe in, in the fact that you can change uh, this um, dysfunctional system through, through consuming uh, products or through uh, like dietism, um, but we still think that it's, um, it's a relevant um, way to look at how we relate to food and how we relate to our food system. Um, so today, I think we are more, uh, we are we're interested in, in what our role as artists are in, in creating bonds and kinship with uh, the biosphere. And, um, and what we, we basically do that through uh, storytelling still and through uh, performances and through uh, cooking and dinners. So there's still this food element. And um, I think it's, we use it as a tool for yeah, maybe for listening um, and for conversation and for um, and for uh, digestion. Basically, it's it's a way that we can also like yeah connect with uh, with other species through just connect uh, through just digesting. Um, and uh, basically, the projects that we have um, that we are going to talk about today is um, is actually also related to silver pasture. So I'm really happy that, uh, that you talked about that and thank you so much for your presentation. Um, let's see where we have. So we're on our Wikipedia now and we use this as a as form of publishing tool because we also um, believe in in the, the role of like uh, publishing and as a, as a way to democratize our knowledge base around the food uh, system and food web. Um, so we have this extensive, uh, in fact, uh, archive of projects and articles that we, uh, that we have been doing the past uh, two years. Maybe you want to yeah. talk? So um, uh, as it was also linked to, uh, in a way, to the subject uh, of uh, our conversation, that is going to happen now. So these presentations, uh, we wanted to talk about 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 this uh, project called uh, the soft protest rechewing and digest, where uh, we were uh, mainly uh, uh, interested in uh, in uh, holistic grazing, but uh, also uh, in the digestive uh, system of ruminants and uh, the act of rumination, which is basically to reach you something that you have already ingested and that has already spent some time in your guts, but we can't do that. It's mostly cows and other ruminants who are, who are doing it. And um, um, here in this project, the idea was really like um, to, um, to, um, to consume uh, some parts of uh, this digestive system uh, uh, either in uh, the literal way, which means cooking the, the guts uh, of, uh, of calves or cows, but also in the form of, um, of, uh, of in some sort of sculptural form uh, to see exactly how it looks when it's not cooked. And uh, in a, another fashion, which is also uh, just uh, something we are really interested in. Uh, it's just like the imitation uh, of, um, for instance, meat and all products that are linked to, to animals that are basically often shown as the main problem uh, in, uh, in our food system in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And um, we also invited uh, a farmer, Cornel uh, Van Rijn, uh, who is really, really involved in this idea of holistic grazing and also uh, of this idea that 
um, sometimes, in some, not always, uh, not in all landscapes, but uh, ruminants are super efficient uh, in their way of grazing, in the cycle of grazing, uh, to actually uh, force and to, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, motivate, in a way, um, the grass to, to grow um, uh, stronger roots and to store uh, to carbon, sequester. to sequester carbon. Uh, and mainly in, uh, in soils uh, like uh, peat soils, where, uh, that are quite common uh, in the Netherlands, mainly in North Holland. Uh, so uh, this farmer uh, was uh, uh, really defending the idea that uh, those types of soil, uh, they need uh, ruminants to, uh, to survive and to keep their carbon stored for a long time, uh, instead of getting, for instance, dry or burnt in a way or another, because it was also a way to, uh, to that was also used to uh, eat places before, even though it's not so common now, to, uh, to use the pit soils uh, as some sort of coal or, or gas. And uh, all these stories that goes over, uh, around uh, holistic grazing uh, in North Holland uh, were shown during this uh, performative dinner uh, where we also produced cheese, uh, uh, smoked cheese, smoked with A, and there were some demonstration of, of the, the way uh, this crazy digestive system uh, works basically yes and um first of all we were really interested in this role of the cow which was which has become a sort of controversial topic uh, in the whole climate debate and we were interested in also representing um, this uh, particular animal and its role that it plays in our ecosystem and and really just like yeah represented and it also ended in a sort of fiction in a way because we we had this yeah. discussion with Cornel and Ryan and then from there on we would create this sort of fictional future, future scenarios of how we imagine the cow in the future um, and we would do this with the participants of the dinner so yeah it, it became a sort of speculative uh, event mm -hmm. in some way um, and um, what else I wanted to say something else um, yeah, and, and we also we also produced a podcast for, for this event that people could listen to. And that was also, that's also part of the way that we work. We normally do this project, which often is an art project or an artistic concept. And then we, we often have like a, um, a, a material that is, that is podcast, which is also distributed to people who were not necessarily part of this event. Um, so this was like an example of the way we work. We're not going to go through all the projects we did, but this is quite representative, and this is, I guess, going to be useful for uh, the subject we're going to tackle afterwards. But we wanted also just to, to take a look at uh, the last project we did uh, this summer with uh, with Setu. Uh, it's a, a art festival that happened uh, in. Uh, French Brittany in Bretagne, uh, because that's, let's say, the first time uh, we went um, into a direction that is more like uh, uh, directly uh, working with, uh, with farmers and uh, trying to, uh, to, um, to explore new tools to uh, increase biodiversity in, uh, in lands. And, uh, and this tool, uh, for this project was just a strip of bare soil um, that can foster um, uh, the, the what we call solitary bees, but also uh, other types of insects. But here, like uh, the focus was uh, was put on uh, these little bees that are really interesting pollinators and wild pollinators, and that are often more efficient than uh, domesticated honeybee to, um, to uh, pollinate uh, massively uh, fields and uh, wild spaces around uh, the, way, the, the place where they, uh, they uh, do their nests. So here, there was really something that we want to, um, to tackle more and more, which is the idea to, um, 
to be somehow like uh, like lobbyists somehow uh, for for tools that are uh, environmentally bene beneficial uh, to the landscape. So nothing to do with food here. And this is um, the kind of partnership we'd like to, um, to, uh, to pursue uh, on uh, our residency here uh, in Maastricht in uh, the Jan van Eyck Academy. But all this goes along always with still food, still ceremonial, um, uh, let's say, happening. And also all uh, the pedagogical parts where we invite people to discover what solitary bees are and to try to find them in the wild, etc. Yes, and um, yeah, like I think what we what we're interested in is uh, how we can make our work more infrastructural. Let's say so it it uh, it surpasses this like these small events are often in the art world and how we are interested in how we can actually create a more structural uh, approach to, to our works. Um, but nevertheless, I think talking about fiction, that is still an approach we also really believe in. Like here, it was more like a, a fiction in, term, in terms of ceremony um, in a way. Um, so it was not directly fictional, but, but this element is always still quite interesting. And, we had several people who came to us afterwards and, and asked how they could reproduce uh, this, this um, method of nature conservation um, in their own gardens, for example. Um, yeah. We created this, um, yeah, this little uh, uh, foldable flyer with some wild seeds in there and, and an explanation of how you could reproduce uh, this such group. So yeah, it, it sort of became its own like um, micro uh, grassroots uh, movement somehow. Um, and of course, we are not the inventors of this method. Uh, it's something that is, is used in, in nature conservation and uh, connected to farming. Um, but we were just interested in sort of reappropriating it uh, in this context. Um, yeah, so we, we, are, we are seeking um, a collaboration with uh, perhaps with this university called Bargaining University that is here in Holland, which is really like the, the sort of food valley of the of the Europe. Even um, so, there's a lot of things to critique from there, but we are also extremely interested in 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 infiltrating that uh, institution somehow. And this project could maybe be a way that we could get in contact with with Wageningen in some way. Um, and yeah, we would like to basically uh, to to ask farmers to collaborate with us and to uh, create these soil strips uh, and to monitor them over time because this project was not really monitored afterwards. It was so in a way it stays as a sort of symbolic uh, thing. In a way. Yeah. So I don't yes. know if um, yeah, this. Uh, I will um, also say like. Uh, this tool, the wiki, that we, are, we always used to, to present our work, and that is also an archive of our work, is uh, one side of uh, one of the tools we use. We also uh, have something more mainstream, which, which is just our Instagram account, but which allows us to reach out to a lot of people. And that is really interesting to, um, to produce pedagogical content and to uh, uh, confronted to a super wide audience, audience that has not so much knowledge about agriculture or about um, uh, biology, not generally. Yeah, and it is, um, yeah, it, it allows us to also really uh, boil everything down to a format that is understood, really. Um, so it's also a good exercise for us, although like it is in a way depressing to use a platform like Instagram, but but in a sense, it, it works as, as a democratic, a, a way of democratizing uh, these topics still because it caters to different, uh, younger uh, public. Um, so I think it's also important for us that we, we also, uh, we also um, 
navigate on those on those platforms still um, yeah. although we are also against them there's a lot to critique about them but yeah so yeah. i think learn. yeah i think uh, that's it for now then we can always discuss more afterwards yeah okay thank you so much Nikki and Robin um wow beautiful practice uh, i love this idea of um using the meal as this kind of story making um process and tapping into sort of like the ceremonial and uh the ritual and and the um yeah the heartwarming aspects of of, of and the collectivity of sharing a meal um And uh, yeah, I guess if, if anybody from Wageningen University is out there in listening to the YouTube, uh, please get in touch via the, uh, via the YouTube comments. Also, if you have any questions for our speakers, we still have one left. Uh, please also put those in the comments and they will make it to our computer screens. Um, so I think uh, the question asked um, by the last speakers about how to work with people outside of the arts, work with farmers, work with scientists, uh, maybe pol uh, policymakers, as well as a question of um, create a sort of infrastructure around the work that goes beyond the art world is something that our next speaker can, um, can perhaps help us uh, digesting. Um, and with that, I would like to present Fernando Garcia Dori, uh, who has work engages with the relationship between culture and nature as manifested in multiple contexts from landscapes and the rural to desires and expectations in relation to identity crisis, utopia and social change. Interested in the harmonic complexity of biological forms and processes, His work addresses connections and cooperations from microorganisms to social systems and from traditional art languages drawing um, to collaborative agroecological projects and, and actions. Um, and since 2010, Fernando has been developing Inland, an arts collective uh, that's dedicated to agricultural, social and cultural production and a collaborative agency. Um, inland confronts various problems of a system that is collapsing at its environmental, cultural, and financial levels, affecting both the planet and the individual by formulating critical tools and applying them through experimental practice, among many other things. It's an incredibly rich um, project, which I'm uh, excited to give the word over to Fernando. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Cecil. And thank you, Frame, for organizing. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to also have the chance to hear more and in person from the, let's say, um, sister tribal organizations like the Self Protest Digest and the Embassy of the North Sea that I've been following. So I'm very happy to get to know a little bit more, close to being in person. Um, let me, um, well, go a little bit through the, the some examples and questions that might. Uh, build up a little bit on what we have been talking today and the, and the very necessary reflections on, uh, that you pointed at the beginning, Cecil. So if I can show some images, I'm going to, to go through a little bit of cases in which we have been trying to, to look at that uh, possibility of uh, opening a space in cultural production to a diverse agency that is also beyond the human. Um, I, I, I think that first we have to look also at the attempts being tried by the scientific um, realm. No? And uh, in this case, I remember being sent uh, like in 2012 or something to, 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 to the, well, to the old um, people residency where Professor Chan was living. And Professor Chan was in the 80s developing the system of the, of the, of the, um, Uh, dream farms. Dream farms was uh, intended to to be a, a form of defining a, like a symbiotic uh, integrated farm um, and waste management systems 
and uh, himself was developing it in uh, tropical areas and in different uh, locations, but what ne was never really uh, acknowledged as a pioneering scientist on uh, on this um, on this important field no? of transforming waste into the source for multiple uh, symbiotic farms and living systems. Um, sorry, I don't know why the <laughs> the image is not going to the next one. Let me just check. You have to do it like this. But it was very interesting for me to see um, the also the richness of his understanding on uh, on a on a le multiple level no? um, of farming, from uh, algae to to fish ponds to also mushrooms or even uh, bacteria that would produce uh, gas and methane. So the dream farm system was like a, like a, almost we could say a philosophical stone no? for waste, but it was tested in, in some places, also in uh, developing countries, which was very interesting. But uh, at some point he, 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 well, he now he passed away and most of his work was non-descripted. So the, the, the slides I was showing at the beginning are like corrupted files of the, his diagrams that uh, uh, we are trying to kind of recover and, recon and rebuild somehow. It's like uh, trying to find a, an archeology span of, of scientific thinking uh, when the ecological paradigm was, uh, was was exploding and um, then here for example we see also that other level of the, the importance of farming with bacteria in terms of methane production and that's something we have been trying as well at this micro scale of, uh, of other agencies uh, with, with cheese. Uh, we produce cheese in the north of, of Spain where we have a, an, a project about recovering an abandoned village and there we are also exploring these other agencies. For example we see the stage where we're making a, a a form of hybrid shepherd wolf that is in between a protected species, uh, both animal and uh, and uh, and um, um, and human, uh, non-human animal, and uh, and then uh, developing as well the the, the possibility of uh, understanding the the storage of the cheese in the caves as a sort of a, of a server's farm that you know that usually underground with all the also uh, crypt crypt cryptological knowledge that many caves uh, have, in this case, a cave from, uh, from uh, Mexico, but transforming this uh, coded uh, um, crypto information into blockchain and then developing the cheese coin. That would be a, a currency that would be circulating uh, amongst the, the inland um, community of supporters as well. Also, we have been trying with uh, ephemeral architecture. In this case, a monumental uh, goat's pavilion for house and birth. And then we're thinking as well this idea no, of uh, the pavilion just being a place for contemplation. But in this case, it would be a place for use and, 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 and fun for, for goats. Uh, sorry. And uh, as well as a place for new rituals regarding the maple dance in this case. So we developed a, a script for a performance that would involve like the transition from Christmas and the Christmas tree being recycled into a spring, the 1st of May, and a sort of um, anti-gentrification of the countryside and against Brexit and uh, authoritarian populism's uh, ideologies uh, for a countryside free of that, let's say. But I think it's also important to, to try to share agency amongst other regions. In this case, it was a whole rice field for Guangzhou Biennale, who was invited to take part and then look at this last rice field in Guangzhou in South Korea, and uh, developing like sort of different uh, situations, like almost like animated GIFs or animatronics with, uh, with the neighbors around the, the, the last rice field they wanted to protect, and the rice field itself becoming like a sort of an agent and a, and a and we can say also a, a theater stage no? uh, with the little the, the richness of amphibians and other uh, species that of course uh, boast you know, in, a, in, a, in a rice field. Um, the youngsters, for example, created also characters like the cloud people and uh, these forms of having like a suburban community living in the towers near this place you know, to become also like a temporary, uh, well, uh, uh, animistic uh, no, uh, theater company was uh, a very interesting process. But from those experiments, I would like to move into inland as a sort of a parent institution that tries to build on, on knowledge, forms of training and forms of, of production to create also a form of economy that we find very important to, to reconnect you know, uh, both the precarious existences of cultural workers with land workers. You know? uh, 
just a few farmers and the most industrialized one will make it as, 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 as much as a few artists. So we need to, to find this hybrid form of, uh, of communion around the land as a possible space for other, other forms of life. And then in inland, we test with uh, different villages where we develop projects producing books or cheese, but also empowering or trying to facilitate a, a pastoralist movement of nomadic peoples. This is quite important because the World Alliance of Nomadic Peoples uh, is like a form of arrangement between uh, tribes and uh, peoples who, who rely on, on the use of territory in communal ways, many often, very often, and with uh, adapted breeds of animals. So we, we brought them in 2007. That was the beginning of the World Gathering of Nomadic Peoples. And for us, it's a great opportunity in Europe to learn uh, the, the, the European sections of the pastoralist movement to learn from the, the realities that indigenous peoples in other parts of the world still have in terms of a rich cosmology and so on. So in this sense, uh, there is a there is a lot of uh, developing uh, an, uh, an assemblage, no, an agreement. This was the result of a whole night of discussion on how to have a, an assembly and a movement, and then we are having now the possibility to have a voice in the UN fora and in other spaces. Well, also training with educational structures like the Shepherd School which has been going since 2004, teaching people who are interested in learning the trade uh, from uh, veteran shepherds and rethinking as well what is to be a shepherd today. Um, and also new curriculum that is another educational project bringing together uh, students from different universities. Actually, we work with the uh, Fachenimchen uh, students from uh, from uh, landscape um, design and architecture, and then we bring them to the village we are recovering, and uh, there we look at uh, possible curricula that would go through other uh, spaces of interaction that are not just, you know, the the, the disciplines or the of the um, different subjects, but more what the mountain as a space of interaction with other species, the village, the space of also uh, conviviality, the forest. And then we, we work on those spaces uh, and sometimes developing long-term projects. Like now we are working with uh, Serpentine Gallery and with other institutions to, to this idea of rethinking a mountain no? and recommoning a mountain. In this case, uh, that was covered with eucalyptus trees in the time of Franco and becoming now a native forest. This is the first time, so in the village itself. Learning a lot from the locals, I think, is crucial. We are used to, used to be like in you know, a sort of a monologue in the art realm. And I think uh, if we are looking at forms of exchange, in this case, with uh, other species, we have a lot to learn from uh, from the people in the land who have grown as shepherds for federations, for, for generations. And then also the forms of overcoming the individual, overcoming the everyday through these uh, ritualistic also moments of celebration no? and other characters and the... Uh, and, uh, and the beings no, that become possible with the mask. Um, we are also interested in connecting the countryside and the city. I think this is, is crucial in our days. No? Uh, there's a huge gap. Maybe it's not so visible in the Netherlands, but it's more of a, of a, of a dense the population, populated land, but in Spain, the, 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 it's a radical change. So we, we came walking from the mountains with the flock recently to the city. Uh, there's a lot of pictures of sheep coming on here. But well, the interesting thing is how you try to hack or crash <laughs> with, the, with the city, you know, and especially the outskirts, the peri-urban tissue with, uh, uh, with an, uh, this organic movement of the sheep, you know, finding uh, the path through highways and the different like disrupted landscapes that we are like living for our uh, for um, the next generations. So um, once we arrive to the to the park, uh, we stay here. Now we have the ship in the park of Madrid, and they stay there for half of the year. Of course, a lot of people come, schools and children. And that's also very important. No? So we were thinking on an infrastructure uh, that was built. To, to host all these different users and people to approach the, the park and to become like a sort of a forest flock classroom. So we also were testing this year special education for people for diverse abilities, no? which I think is also interesting as another form of a uh, not tedo anthropocentric form of viewing the world. Um, so the, 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 the generations gather around the, around the ship, which is very interesting. And also we try with uh, this mobile artifact that is like a, partly a, a radio studio where we make a sound uh, art experimentation, experimenting uh, slash cheese making place. So we, we produce cheese uh, with milk from the, from the ship here, which we find very important because it's a way to say that the animals are actually part of a form of uh, finding our way of living in the land. 
and, uh, and a way of economy. And we think that's also very important uh, to reflect on as, as, uh, as artists and as human beings today, you know, these days, like which economies and which forms of more uh, evolved economies we can develop. I want to just to show you a little uh, text by Vincent Desprez. It's very interesting because he's talking about uh, she's talking about the cosmological ship. So uh, it's more saying like uh, uh, I don't know if you can read it. But the, the cosmos emerges again and again out of diverse ways of composing worlds, of crafting attachments and connections that link soil and earth, compost, humus, mud, grass, dogs, sheep, humans, and more. All of this to say that there are more there are some places on earth where the cosmos passes through the mouth of the sheep and we were testing with a sound artist Susana Jimenez Carmona to make a sound piece uh, based on the recordings that the that the, the sheep could do and uh, let me see if I can play it for a moment and if you can hear please just let me know when I like uh, speaking for too long because I tend to <laughs> lose uh, conscience on that well, if you can you have, hear, you have a bit, five more minutes. So. Okay, I don't know if you can hear. Uh, we now run recording by Bea the Sheep Herschel. The microphones were just like uh, um, attached with a uh, tape to her ears for, for a while. The, the idea with this was to, to also look at the, yeah, <laughs> like at the, at the sound environment in the years of the sheep as well. Also, the sheep carry, carry seeds with themselves and also with the, with the, the Isis faces that uh, allow the possibility for plants to adapt to different latitudes in a faster way that would be possible with the normal movement carried by the wind and so on, in that way allowing um, a higher adaptability to climate changing conditions and, uh, and transforming ecosystems. So um, I think I would leave it here <laughs> with the idea of, uh, of, uh, of now maybe um, rethinking the role of the artist as also the 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 a resensitivized <laughs> person that can gather others and bring uh, like a multiple agency to 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 create other forms of life no? i think uh, in the past it was about framing and about pointing at something and then working with materials i think this is the time now to start to develop these more uh, sustained and uh, durable uh, in, uh, structures in which we could rely upon, even in moments in which, for example, the, the idea of a welfare state that at the end is associated with the idea of a, of a neoliberal representational democracy, democracy might be uh, in question. So I think enough pictures of sheep. This was a few weeks ago, had the biggest snow here. I think I would leave it here and then we can talk a little bit more later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernando. Wow, that was incredible. Um, I have so many questions, but I was also just thinking that there are so many overlaps of interests and, and desires and wishes for collaboration, for rethinking the role of the artists um, between um, these three uh, presentations. So I was wondering, now that you're in the same room together, is there something you would like to ask of the other presenters? And it could be really practical as well, like how do we do this? Um, yeah. Um, yes, um, I, both of you, uh, represents something that we are really uh, admiring a lot um, and I'm specifically interested in yeah how we how we can suppress the art world and actually have like intergovernmental uh, impact or or um, have a saying in policy making even um, 
and I know that you have experience with that and I, I'm curious to to how you, you came to that and yeah what it involved for you to get to that place uh, so I'm ex actually asking both of you um, but yeah you can you can decide who will start um. but yeah perhaps I can start yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the the um... Uh, we set up the embassy very consciously as a uh, free space uh, in our initial facing. So we committed ourselves 10 years to the project. And the first four or five years are all about listening. Then we sort of move on to what we call the speaking phase. And then we end with a negotiation phase. And we also really wanted to take the time to, to go through those steps. The thing with uh, the North Sea is, of course, we didn't choose the North Sea out of the blue, if that's the right uh, wording, but uh, because it sort of already transcends the normal uh, political repres repre representative borders that we have. So the nation state or the individual or, um, or species, you know, it sort of already transcends that level uh, in its complex entity that it is. But what is also uh, um, true for the North Sea is that the sea is already like every square meter is full of human interests. So you have, it's, it's sort of, and often it's, it's approached like almost like a cake, like everybody has a piece of it, you know, like um, whether these are internet cables or uh, container traffic, shipping, uh, fisher, fisher uh, fisherman interests like loads of uh, many economic interests um, in this space. So what we decided is that um, we are of course keeping a, a close eye on policy and how that develops now, but we also chose very specifically to make these first phases of the embassy create this free space in which we also find the space to rethink uh, the fundaments of our uh, politics and our political institutions without immediately getting entangled in, uh, in current interests um, and also trying to rethink what is actually uh, the political entity that needs to be represented because perhaps we, we, we should approach this in a very different way. And how can we reimagine that? How can we actually listen to relationships instead of uh, fixed entities and how can we move to a more situated kind of politics and uh, the nice thing is that we are we work as a collective so people join us for certain projects or uh, sort of are sort of an outer shell and and in that collective there are certainly people that are in politics uh, or that are connected to policy or that are following us uh, or, or would when we collaborate but we we don't for this moment we specifically have chosen not to directly dive into current uh, policies because it also um, narrows down your perspective in a way. Right. So, so you are in, but you are in a way like um, indirectly perhaps involved with politics or you like want to shape the whole conversation around how we can, how we can uh, integrate the the perspective of other species uh, or the North Sea. Uh, so, yeah, the project is is also about uh, rethinking politics itself. So, what does a politics what the, what would a politic uh, look like that effectively represents uh, our interrelatedness with non-humans? What would that actually look like? What would the, what would the radical ecological politics actually look like? It's it's yeah. more these questions that we are. Um, uh, researching, uh, we're building prototypes, we're doing all kinds of stuff, but uh, we're focusing more on on those questions. Super interesting. Actually, did, did you uh, participate to um, uh, make it work? You know, like the project uh, uh, in the theater of um, Les Amandiers uh, with uh, Bruno Latour uh, and Spip, maybe? Yeah, unfortunately not. But uh, last year we did have a very good uh, Latour year, so to say, because we worked together with the Spinoza Lens Foundation. He won uh, the Spinoza Lens Prize. 
and we had a, a, a full program, uh, Welcome to the Parliament of Things, uh, which the tour was also uh, involved and uh, he gave uh, um, a special Spinoza lecture also last year. So he's certainly aware of us and we have invited him several times. He also came to do sessions with us and uh, yeah, but, but not that one, unfortunately. <laughs> Fernando, uh, maybe you would also like to um, uh, comment and actually I'm just going to segue in a question from the audience requesting you to also uh, mention a bit more the role of the shepherd. Talk more about the role of the shepherd. That's quite a broad question, <laughs> but maybe you can ask to <laughs> specify a little bit more, but I will I will try to interpret. Um, but uh, regarding the question uh, that Nick and Robin were asking, and uh, also, well, what um, Anne was saying, I'm, I would be very interested on in exploring this possibility of the, the radical ecology politics, no? in the sense of going beyond the frame of the already terms of the conversations that human agencies have have established. No? I'm thinking how, yes, how this could be also started to be introduced in the, Euro, in the European and Western context. No? We know that, for example, Ecuador has uh, in its constitution the rights, for nature, the rights of nature as, uh, as granted. No? How that effectively happens to be established. Uh, there, are, there are some cases where this is being discussed, especially also instigated by the indigenous communities and indigenous peoples for rivers, river basins, and so on. So far, I think that we are trying um, to exist, uh, having an impact uh, in, a, in a two, two different um, levels or realms. No? One is the, the existence of the social movement itself, so the pastoralist movement as a social movement, and I think that people living in the land and from the land have a, have a long genealogy of, of resistance and struggles uh, against the imposition of a certain political rule coming from, from a side, no? from above. And um, it's very hard to be, you know, you know, nurturing that and at the same time having to be um, fulfilling you know, the, the, the criteria to be part of the conversations, for example, with FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, or with even the United Nations bodies uh, that seem to be like, uh, you know, really, really uh, proactive for, for the uh, new awareness on, on the need to, to, to confront this um, ecological crisis. But... At the same time, I think that it's very hard not to be just entangled in never-ending uh, discussion, reference, uh, advisory papers for uh, good practices, um, recommendations, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, yeah, I think uh, we are facing the, 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 the critical moment in which in order to really have things uh, happening, we might have not to be even taking part of those as first of policy making. Because I think that if you consider that in 92, it was when the United Nations started the, the UNEP, no? the United Nations Environmental Program, uh, in all these decades and since 73, when limits to growth was announced, the Bloodland Commission and so on, what we have been very good is in being uh, developing uh, more sophisticated mechanisms of prolonging the existing situation. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm a little bit worried because now it's even the civil society is part of it very often. Civil society organizations are just like, you know, like being having the alternative summit. I mean, in the last year we had the COP25 in Madrid and it was, it was like, a, you know, almost insulting, I would say, because you have like a pavilion for the official delegations, a pavilion for the civil society. Then the NGOs were competing to have media attention in a sort of, like, you know, like a logic of, uh, of uh, keep, keep, keep the thing going. And I don't know, I think uh, we need to start to look more at grassroots, uh, um, radical in the sense of rooted and uh, transformative uh, experiences in, in the land, as you were also explaining on it very well. So probably a bit of, so, of both. And then about the shepherd, just very quick. I think that, uh, a, um, well, a shepherd or a shepherdess, uh, a person who lives in a land uh, and, uh, and makes a living based in the, in the work with uh, animals and uh, livestock, very often in places where farming is not possible or in forms of animal husbandry that are not in conflict with farming. And I'm thinking mountain uh, livestock systems in the tundra and Arctic systems of reindeer herding, for example, or in the desert. 
in those places, uh, this form of uh, mutual uh, care, because the domestic city of uh, the domestication of animals involves a relationship of mutual care, it's no longer possible to just say, let's rewild all sheep, no? let's make them free. <laughs> At some point, these animals have been developed through millennia of adaptation of the species and then rely very much on, the, on this form of, of mutual care. They, yeah, they, they, they represent for me um, a good example of rethinking how we live on earth, of the growth as well. And I'm, I'm trying to be, uh, how to say, uh, um, explanatory on the, on the fact that mobile pastoralism and extensive livestock systems are not the same as industrial farming or uh, industrial livestock systems. So uh, in that case, I would say that we became just uh, managers of, uh, of an industry, uh, of an animal industry. But uh, a pastoralist is for me more a custodian of an ecosystem uh, in a symbiosis with how animals also uh, preserve that ecosystem. So do, let's not forget that rangelands, uh, hay, meadows, and other ecosystems are very, very diverse. And that a lot of wild species also rely on this. Uh, and as uh, Nell, the, the, the friend and compañero who is with the goats now would say, I'm not herding my goats, the goats are herding me. No? They, they actually, <laughs> you go behind them and so on. So it's more complex than, than it seems no? in terms of some maybe um, simplistic reading no? of, uh, of, uh, of a domina, domination of the animal by the, by the human in terms of uh, pastoralism. <clears throat> That reminds me of something I read on um, on uh, on your wiki, uh, Nikki and Robin, uh, about the fungi, uh, where you were suggesting that perhaps we weren't cultivating the fungi, but they were cultivating us. Um, and I feel like the, the the mushrooms and the fungi are um, are sort of just below the surface of our of our conversations as well. Um, but could you could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. But this is, this is, in some way, it's a twist we can do uh, about like uh, most uh, domesticated species, you know, like uh, some, some could, one could say that uh, even, even wheat, uh, uh, like domesticated us to, to make, to, to become like the most prevalent uh, plant species, species uh, on earth in the end, like, and, uh, and being somehow dominant even though like, it implies a lot of uh, of uh, monoculture, etc. But uh, speaking about uh, about finally molds or yeast uh, from uh, beer to bread and uh, all uh, dairy products that are fermented, uh, for sure, uh, uh, like even the fact that uh, they are, they were present uh, before uh, we began to domesticate them because they are present everywhere in the grass, in, uh, in the soil, uh, in uh, any uh, uh, farm that does uh, animal husbandry, you can find all the, all the, the microbes that are used in most uh, typical cheeses. Uh, and maybe as they were here before us, we can imagine that they, they managed to colonize our food system. <laughs> And, uh, and to make us discover those uh, great flavors and great way to preserve dairy products, for instance. The, the myth is uh, that uh, uh, people started just to keep milk in, uh, in uh, animals' um, uh, guts. Uh, I guess it was mostly sheep uh, uh, at the beginning. And uh, the, um, the animal rennet, like the, end the enzyme, the the enzyme that is used uh, to curd, uh, to, to get uh, the coagulation of milk, did uh, its job. And then uh, in place of milk, they found cheese in, uh, in these guts they were using just as uh, to transport the milk. So yeah, this could be like the way uh, it's domesticated, I suppose. Do you think that um, in your, in, in your, um research into the role of the cow and this kind of problematic uh, role that the cow has, uh, has uh, gotten in, uh, in the climate crisis. Do you think um, some notes could be taken maybe from um, Fernando's um, research into the sheep 
Or what, what do you think about that? Could that be sort of like translated into the realm of the cow? Yeah, Maybe a question for, the, for both of you. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, the thing with the with cows is that yeah you can also move them around like i guess maybe and you're doing in your yeah. farm yeah. like uh, you're doing a farm of silver silver pasture and um, where that is also uh, calling on the use of of movement and um, basically following the growth of grass so this is this is definitely uh, also an old way of of, uh, of farming with cows that's that's always been around movement and Certainly, yeah. That's uh, that's certainly relevant. I would say. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually more interested in also in your in your farm and and um, and I I'm educated a farmer, but I don't. I'm a farmless farmer. Let's say I don't have a farm. Uh, I'm doing a garden here in the Van Eyck, um, but I'm interested in also the role of small scale farming and what what that can do to rural uh, development and rural environments and as you also said they're connecting the city and the landscape and i see them as a as a great um a great tool for change also um but i also have a lot of precautions let's say um first of all like um i like that the, the small scale farm can utilize um less uh, fossil fuels let's say but then you are very dependent on volunteers for example and how does that how how does that work you know like i'm this is a this is a, a critique i have somehow against uh, the small scale farms that there's a lot of volunteering involved and i am just wondering your thoughts on that and and whether there is a way to perhaps um I don't know if we have to uh, prevent it, but at least I would like to maybe hear your thoughts on on the role of volunteering in terms of small scale farming. Yeah, that's a very good question. Now, in um, in my ideal world, of course, uh, you don't need volunteers to run a farm. Uh, and I think that was also one of the reasons why we were so inspired by the small scale farm of Richard Perkins in Sweden. It's called the Richdale Permaculture Farm because he's, do, he's economically doing very well. So he's got a really nice running business and he produces uh, serious amounts of food, but then also really high quality, you no know, pesticides and um, um, building topsoil and increasing biodiversity. I mean, these could be an end, end, end. But there is a but, and certainly also in the Netherlands, um, where there's a lot of pressure on land and access to land. Mm -hmm. And um, you can run a farm. I still think it's possible without volunteers if you uh, if you have a, but you need, you need you shouldn't underestimate the business plan and the business side of it and uh, there's still uh, some other issues that are bigger than your farm and bigger than the capability that you have of, of running a profitable farm uh, which is that on average we are like our prices are like organic products and sometimes a little bit more expensive than that so the problem that you have with that is that you already exclude uh, a range of people that cannot afford your products and ideally you don't want to, you don't want that to be happening but uh, it is true that this way of farming is more labor intensive uh, so for for it to be able to compete with large-scale mechanized industrial farming that would mean that uh, to enable this kind of uh, farming um, to happen fully without volunteers would also mean uh, um, a redivision of taxes, for example, because now we tax labor um, and we make certain choices with uh, BTV, so uh, with fat taxes. Um, so the thing is, it's not only the farmer that can solve this, it's not only the consumer uh, that can solve this issue of, of transitioning towards um, a regenerative uh, farming system, but it's actually, it, it also includes the financers, uh, what is financed and what not. Now there's a large focus on capex in financing, for example, 
so uh, uh, buildings, machines, uh, that kind of stuff uh, that is preferably financed by banks. Uh, we don't have a lot of stuff. We have a lot of compost. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So the 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 thing is, um, it is one about having a solid business plan. Uh, but two, I, I also think it's 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 about a, a bigger transition that is just necessary to make this work. And I mean, there are lots of people that want to move into farming. Uh, so if you would redirect that with uh, Texas, for example, it would make a large yeah, difference. It, it makes me think about like uh, uh, this idea. I think that was uh, mainly Noam Chomsky that was uh, uh, fighting for it somehow. It's like the idea to tax machines as we tax uh, workers in a way, and to cr or like to create some kind of um, of fairness, uh, mm -hmm. uh, because like basically a huge um, uh, conventional farming doesn't ask for so much workers, but a lot of machines, yeah, and they are not taxed for using it. Yeah, and, and I also really like the parallel that Fernando made, like with um, with artists that are also in a very precarious positions, uh, like farmers. Um, also, because you know, in in a farm world, completely over subsidized in terms of large scale land uh, use. So if you if you have large areas of land, you just get a lot of subsidy. So also in the subsidy structure, it doesn't make a lot of sense if we want to move to, to a truly uh, uh, more than sustainable uh, farm system. And um, and I think it all also boils down to values and choices. Okay, what do you value as a society and why do you decide uh, to subsidize one thing or to tax another thing? Um, and, and and what are you willing to pay for food? And if we are willing to pay that for food or for art or for having artists as a, as a valuable part of our society, like uh, like how can we also embed that within uh, our society? And uh, yeah, I think there's also, perhaps you can say something about it, but I, I think it's interesting that you made that parallel. Well, yeah, Moulton, going back to the mm, comparison, I, I liked a lot the, the reflection no, on the, well, uh, what happens with the organic farms having to, 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 to go to run on based on the volunteer non-paid work. No? I, uh, I think it's an interesting reflection, but uh, if we look historically uh, to the fact that uh, small farmers uh, and peasantry has been uh, like uh, for centuries um, undervalued, no? their, their job or their produce has been undervalued. That in the past was uh, even studied by rural sociologists as a form of a peasant economy, most focused, uh, more focused on reproduction rather than in production, accumulation and so on. Anyway, we go to industrial revolution and to these days and um, Yes, uh, uh, maybe instead of, of uh, considering that the, that the farmer is like putting more hours that are valued, other people could put those more hours, you know what I mean? Like to share also the fact of what it takes to have a reproductive economy in terms of uh, reproducing the, the soil, no? living matter. And in that sense, I would even say that it would be like a community service. So it would be a soil service. It should be like almost imposed, as in some countries, it is imposed to go to the to the to the army or to military training. I don't want to be the, the Cambodian <laughs> red hammer here, but what I mean is that the people who go to a farm to make woofers, they are like super privileged because they not only live in a city with a great salary, but they also even miss the touch of nature and they go on the weekends to help a farmer, which actually is like very healthy and uh, uplifting. So, I mean, I, I find that that's also part of, uh, of, uh, of the transmission of knowledge. And it's not just my time, uh, my the money I get for it, but also my time, what I learned for this. No? So in the shepherd school and in other forms, many people are going to, to farms to really reconnect with the knowledge of farming because they might in a few years start their own farm and because their parents were no longer farmers. So this happens in Europe because we have 2% of the population farming. Most of the people living in the cities come buying food in supermarkets totally disconnected from the land. And unless there are systems, either formal or informal uh, to, 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 to transition, to, to acquire the skills and the capacities, then this is not going to, to, to change no? that uh, percentage. And what happens with 98 percent of the population eating every day but only two percent producing it is that we move 
very, very fast. And the Netherlands is a good example into the robot robotization of farming, no? the, the, the highly technified forms of farming. So I don't know. I don't. I don't see any problem with it. <laughs> I just. I just think we need to far to find other ways of va of valuing and other forms of even monetizing and uh, and uh, and uh, yeah and having fair exchanges. The cheese coin, for example, that we use or we are just testing, involves that one day of helping in inland involves the one cheese coin or means against cheese coin. So you don't have to be rich in money in euros to eat healthy. You can also be rich in time and eating healthy in, in that way. You know? So yeah, I just wanted to do <laughs> yeah, like, And I am not entirely against volunteering. I also see all the benefits from it. Um, I think what, I, um, what I, I find really interesting is when it becomes part of a structure, when it, for example, is uh, part of the CSA model or the uh, participatory uh, farming model, um, where you sort of, you're part of the risk taking in the farm, you also participate in terms of labor, you were sort of uh, co cooperative in a way uh, in the farm and, and I think then it's interesting because then we are changing structure. But, but what I'm critiquing is that when our farms are running on full-time volunteer work, then we're being sort of, the price is artificially low as well as the subsidy system is doing. And I think that is not changing the overall structure, which is rotten somehow. That is just, that is just uh, leveling with it somehow. Uh, but I do see, of course, like I have been doing a lot of volunteering in farming and I've learned a great deal from it. Um, but I, I'm still critiquing the role of, of volunteer work here when it happens like on a, on a full-time scale. Uh, and, but certainly there are different, uh, there's different ways of, or different um, forms of it, I would say. Yeah. Hey, but I... I no, well, no. We could also go into the the question of how farm laborers are paid, <laughs> which is sometimes from migrant backgrounds, which is even also a very artificial way of keeping the price of uh, vegetables low, at least as we see in south of Spain with North African uh, manpower. But I wanted to introduce another debate element of discussion, unless in Sicily, but it's just about to Anne as well, uh, and to to you, um, Nick and Robin, the question of diet as being crucial for environmental change no? or environmental transition, both in terms of fishing, and I'm facing this because we are starting in inland work on the north, uh, the Atlantic uh, north coast of Spain and with the fishermen communities there um, and the fisher folk. So, you know, at some point it's like all fishing is bad <laughs> morally, all kind of, um, let's say uh, animal husbandry or milk you drink would involve like uh, climate change effects. I don't know how far we can go more um, uh, more into the, the complexity you know, of that debate and then uh, going to the, the, the shades of gray. You know? And it's not so easy to say, well, yes, uh, like uh, animal products or dairy products are intrinsically bad, but actually depends on how, by whom, where, uh, and compared to what as well, because I would like to know if, if the same uh, as the farmers tend to say, you know, like uh, impossible to compare the pollution a cow originates with the pollution of a single car. You know? But uh, yes, I don't know if you have been also working with that, Anna, in terms of, of fishing. <clears throat> um, yes, not, the, not, not as directly. Um, but I recognize very much the, the plea for nuance. Uh, because also to be against a cow or to be for a tree or uh, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense for me <laughs> because uh, a, a tree or a cow uh, makes um, like the, the, the positive and or negative impact only comes about within a specific context. So um, I, I see this also happening uh, in political debates now in the Netherlands and, um, and I find it a shame. And, uh, and that also goes for, for fishermen. I mean, uh, just as much as farmers. I mean, there's so many ways you can fish. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily need to be an extractive practice. And um, it can also bring a lot. So um, I think, yes, we very much need this kind of nuance. And that means also a reconnection, I think, to place and ways of practices. Um, to know where your food comes from 
and uh, to know how something is uh, fished or produced or whatever uh, makes a big difference. And that's also why I am not such a, um, I'm not per se such a fan of certification uh, because it is also a thing of making something abstract seem less abstract. Uh, like the, my preferred way is to to have things certified by customers or to to just directly connect to to a process so that you you know where it's from so it, it is um, as transparent as it could be um, yeah that's just another we also have another question from um, our YouTube audience, uh, which is uh, whether the speakers can expand a bit on how they integrate rituals into their practice. How important is this dimension in the development of, uh, of your respective projects? So um, yeah, maybe uh, Nikki and Robin, you wanna start when we go around? Yes. Um... Uh, it's yeah I think we have been using rituals um, as a tool for performativity also in our project but also as a as a form of language somehow um, something that is of, has been connected to farming um, before industrialization for example and uh, the project we did in Satu, where we made this uh, strip of soil and we had people coming and, and dancing on it, was actually related to to a dance called uh, Lipline, which is um, which is uh, connected to agriculture in uh, Brittany, and and they have a, a big culture for, for folk dance and and which are, a lot of them are connected to to farming practices. So it was it was a sort of way to also bring back culture into farming and um it's 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 really like a, a, a an emotional tool as well like it it creates something which um which prepares the the sort of um um presence for whatever information we would like to also give to people it's it's it works in a way as the same way as the food does it's like a it's a direct portal into to some other way of understanding or uh, some other form of kinship with uh, the situation with with each other with um, the the elements we're working with um, so it's yeah the the phenomenology the phenomenology I cannot say this word uh, of um, of these rituals are quite uh, quite important somehow in some of the projects that we do yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's. I think that's incredibly important. Also, the sort of embodied knowledge that is perhaps not so easily verbalized and spoken, but which is uh, perhaps passed down from generations and generations. Um, and I, I it, it reminds me a little bit of um, of what I, I saw in a lot of your presentations, which which was this sort of. Um, way of thinking about paying tribute to past knowledges um, and working with practices of the past um, with Fernando's presentation literally um, um, a, a, a scientist and, and the farmer their practice bringing it back and it, it reminds me a little bit of a sort of like distance to this idea that everything has to be constantly innovative um, but that there is there's a lot of knowledge that we should standing on the shoulders of that needs to be acknowledged. So I, I really like that aspect of, of all of your, of all of your presentations as well. Um, maybe, oh, sorry. <laughs> maybe Fernando, you can also uh, elaborate on this. I wouldn't be able to do it as well as uh, Nikki has done. So, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have way more resources in your presentation <laughs> than in uh, ours. No. But it's very hard to, I mean, the thing is that, the thing is that the ritual doesn't come before the community that shares the ritual. And then it's a process of like a, like a, like a, like a um, soil regeneration or, or the, the transition to organic farming that Anne was telling about, you know, it's like building up on, on forms of, uh, of, uh, of, um, 
sensibilization and uh, and uh, and sharing, you know, because of course we can have individual rituals, so we can have the artist proposing a ritual. But what I, I was trying to, to to explain with the case of Guangzhou, with this suburban community in North South Korea, and it's like because it took like a year to prepare the whole performance, and it was a performance. But at the end, I remember one day we had to rehearse uh, the final scene of the performance that was about digging the land and doing the land and. And then uh, they were asked, how do we act this? No? How do we make an acting of digging the land in the form of ritualistic? And it's like, well, someone said, why we don't do it as we do you do other times when we go to just dig together on a Sunday as a form of, you know, of a local community garden where people just gather and do communal work and so on. No? And then they realized that that thing that was a practical every day's money over that they were doing all together just to preserve a piece of land in the middle of the city and so on, suddenly it acquired another quality, you know, it became more sacred or became more transcendent. And I think that's, uh, that's just a change of the gaze. And if an art project helps on that, you know, by, by, by using you know, different elements like, uh, like uh, yeah, like even traditional artistic languages as, as, uh, as, as, as music, as song or as, um, um, uh, fabrics or textile dyeing or whatever, it's great. But it's just that we we need to to go from the very bottom. That is to to start to find that common space, no, uh, shared uh, and that deep deep understandings. No, so not easy. Not too much we can say. Wonderful. And Anna, do you have something to add? Yeah, we also work with a lot of rituals with the embassy. Um, I guess also to sometimes create focus, sometimes to shift perspective, uh, sometimes to make space for something. Uh, like for example, we uh, read poetry to the sea uh, with, uh, with a group of people. Uh, but we also had um, Godzilla uh, giving a lecture to us as humans uh, from the sea. That was also a very interesting uh, ritual. <laughs> And uh, some are more serious, a bit more monumental. We also had um, a funeral for the Holocene uh, in a church. Wow. Uh, because we thought, okay, if we say goodbye to the Anthropocene, what are, done, what are we actually, or if it's the Anthropocene, what are we actually saying goodbye to? And we asked people uh, to bring objects that represented for them uh, you know, the past era, the Holocene, and, uh, and to in a ceremony, uh, say uh, goodbye to them. Um, this was actually also um, accompanied by a shamanistic ritual uh, by Ibelisa Guattari, who did it very uh, beautifully. Uh, so we also invite other people to, to help us to, um, yeah, to, to create these moments uh, for, for different reasons, but uh, yes, we, we do uh, practice quite a lot of rituals if I think about it, yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to bring back the question of representation again. Um, and this, what Annie called the fundamental crisis in representation. Um, and, uh, and I know you worked with um, the legal uh, scholar and researcher, Laura Burgers, who I also had uh, the pleasure of um, inviting for a reading group um, where we were trying to read um, um, texts from the legal field on this question of representing um, so non-human entities like a river or uh, something like that, or uh, future generations, which of course brings us to the project of um, a frame of framed um, in the fall. And one thing that I found really interesting um, that Laura was mentioning is that uh, this structure of representing somebody legally comes with a big uh, problem when you cannot know what that uh, that the the, the entity you want to represent um, on behalf of can tell you what they want. So especially in the case of future generations, like how can you go within a legal system and represent somebody who's not born, whose interests you can never really know, um, but you think that you're doing what's best for them. 
Um, and I found that like I had never thought about um, that um, before. And and I guess we don't have anybody from the legal field per se uh, here. But I was wondering if um, if if you have some thoughts on that. How do we how do we deal with that that question? Yeah, it's a very crucial question. First of all, be always critical of the spokesperson. <laughs> I think that that should always be the case. Um, but I also think it's it, when, when it comes to uh, non-humans, uh, plants, animals, microbes, things to represent, uh, that is also not impossible. Of course, it's something we uh, still have to, to learn a lot um, in the global north. Uh, of, how, of how we should do this. Um, I think there, there are two challenges there specifically. One is also a question we have with the Embassy of the North Sea, because now you see that with uh, a lot of rights of nature example, actually the legal personhood from um, a human perspective is just a little bit extended and then it becomes uh, the, the same framework is sort of used uh, for non-human legal representation. So then the question arouses, is that the right framework? Like, uh, do we do justice to the non-humans by using uh, such a, um, a man-focused framework, you could say? So that's one question. So that's also why we always say with the Embassy of the North, yes, we are looking into whether the North should be a legal person, but we don't know if this is the right way to go at it. Um, and uh, another thing is that, um, we do think, we tend to think that it's sort of impossible to do that kind of representation, but at the same time, somebody can step from an airplane and say, hi, I represent France and we think it's normal. Or, hi, I represent Coca-Cola and we think, oh yeah, that's fine. So um, we do have this kind of uh, weird uh, collective conglomerate abstract representations that we find very normal because we're also used to them. Uh, so that's that's another point that um, and uh, a third point is that in, in other uh, by shifting worldviews, there is uh, all kinds of different representation possible, like the, the beautiful thing with the New Zealand case of the river was that the Maori actually uh, could have legal standing because they said I am the river. Because for, from their perspective, the river is their ancestor and their future. So it's like it's it's the same thing. Uh, so the kind of division that we experience here um, uh, does not make any sense for them. So um, the interesting thing is that that gave them access to legal standing. And with that legal standing, they also changed the law. It was not only the case of the, the river, but they, they, they fundamentally changed also things in the law. So I think there are many options, but yes, always be very critical of the spokesperson. And, uh, and that's still a question that's also something we will be working on for the for the coming years like how can we be fittingly and uh, adequately in a way represent uh, these non-humans and perhaps we even need to shift the the entity that we want to represent because we shouldn't want to represent uh, a non-human entity but um, we are thinking perhaps we should need to represent a relational entity and then it becomes uh, a different kind of representation so yeah, these are my thoughts for now. I just want to uh, to uh, recommend you to look into the work of uh, Sophie Howe, who is the Future Generations Commissioner of Wales, uh, which is a super interesting position to have. And also, of course, yeah, uh, complex. How do you represent the future generations? But she actually prevented a um, motorway from getting built and the, the money was allocated into public transport. So she does have uh, an influence. Uh, and yeah, I find that really interesting. Yeah. And I guess coming back to what you mentioned in your presentation, Annie, that it's, uh, of course, we have uh, the danger of anthropomorphism, but the other side of the coin is paternalism and just assuming that we know what's best for either future generations or um, non-human entities. Um, one thing that I'm thinking of now, I'm looking into microplastics, which is, of course, something that we've... Um, 
thought of in general discourse as a problem of disease, but now there's research that indicates it's actually possibly showing up in our inner ocean, in our bloodstreams. Um, it's also, uh, we have this idea that it's being filtered out of our water systems through water management treatments, but that is also not the case. So I'm wondering, yeah, also when you're talking about this sort of relational question um, of representation, but also maybe of what is your legal body? I, I don't know. I'm thinking that your, our bodies are really extending out into the wastewater and then again, the drinking water that we're producing. So these, these persistent chemicals and, and industrial compounds that are just not breaking down and they're extending beyond really the lifespan that we can understand um, should also maybe have us rethink what is our own legal bodies in a way, if they are so extended out. We're really not these enlightenment um, subjectivities that are discrete and contained. I don't know if that is a, a way of thinking that, that any of you resonate with. Yes, definitely. I, I really think that the reductive um understanding of the self as a, as a restricted individual just not befits uh, our world anymore. So uh, I think the, the, the change that we, that we seek in, in, in politics, also in reimagining a democracy uh, is fundamentally connected with the image we have of ourself. Yes, and yeah. I definitely also think it's like really almost the root of the problem that we see ourselves as something separate from everything else, whereas we are more other than than self, let's say. So, yeah, I think it really everything connects connects back to that that mm. question and that uh, way of seeing things. Actually, for for me, it's, uh, it reminds me of uh, like uh, there is a, a, a recent uh, study that has been uh, actually. Uh, 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 shared by Bruno Latour uh, too. And it's uh, the way some scientists, instead of considering uh, uh, the biomass of mankind to compare it uh, to, with the other biomass, for instance, of trees uh, and uh, fungi and uh, bacteria, etc., they shifted towards a way to, to consider uh, all anthropogenic uh, things including, for instance, concrete infrastructures, not only the human bodies. So it's a bit of a way to considering what's man can, what mankind is uh, by taking account of everything we produced or transformed, even uh, the uh, animals we raise, for instance. And then they, uh, they got to this crazy conclusion that uh, since last year, um, we are heavier than the total biomass on earth if you consider all the infrastructure and uh, and even if you consider for instance the plastic that have been produced it's already it already outweighs the the weight of all animals on earth so this put things in really different perspective uh, too And this was, um, can, you, can you mention again who was um, writing about this or speaking about this I can for, audience who, to, for to, audience who might uh, be watching? Ah, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to give you. I also wanted to say that, well, of course, we are more need than ever no, to start to move into that. Uh, um, well-defined post-humanism, you know, which uh, humans and hum they had hum they had humanist ideas are not just at the center of everything to organize creation. But the thing is that also the post-humanism goes into the direction of our approach, not only to 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 yeah, to the other entities as non-human animals and living beings and waters, but also technologies. No? And I think that we haven't uh, Fortunately, in all this uh, conversation, talked about the specific situation we are in now as a species, but it's finally that we spend more and more time in these little boxes in the screens, not like next to other boxes in the screen. So at the end, in our living cells or houses. So it's a bit difficult because uh, the more we are relying on, the people are building their 
their identities. And uh, I was working with, uh, uh, with students from a master on environmental design that were researching on how newer generations, I mean, uh, Generation Z and so on, have, uh, for example, in the US, a, a rate of um, self uh, injuries and, uh, you know, and uh, suicide that is like comparable to a generation that has grown within a war with that level of like traumatic impact no, in the psychology. And this is because of TikTok. So, I mean, there are similar things. So, I mean, how, you know, there are ways into, to, we could open ways into, uh, yes, going beyond the individual, no, that is very much needed is there is a, we as a species, I find we are super gregarious as, <laughs> as much as the sheep or something. So social media so on is like a substitute, no? It's like a little bit of a poor substitute driven by, by an algorithm of that need of going beyond the self. So it's hard because, uh, yeah, sometimes you find that uh, yeah, you have less and less, uh, let's say, uh, a stimulus or urge to really go and do things with others, no? <laughs> Somewhere and, uh, and with others that are even not uh, human. So, yeah, but I don't know, it's interesting. Interesting times. It's a little bit in between both sides. We have uh, more and more people also uh, applying for the Shepherd School, so you never know. <laughs> Maybe a good um, wrap up, I think, uh, for this. Is there perhaps for each of you uh, some final uh, input that you would like to uh, close with, perhaps in response to uh, Fernando's? Um, uh, bringing in of our uh, current situation and looking at each other through Zoom and um, uh, looking with envy at all the images you shared of people uh, being together and close to each other. I feel like almost like you know, really this skin hunger, uh, seeing those pictures. Um, perhaps just just to, to shortly uh, wrap up if uh, if you have some uh, some insight on on perhaps how to rethink uh, rituals in this pandemic times so and bringing your practices into it. Personally, I will just say that at least uh, we don't need to burn uh, fossil fuel to, uh, to, to be together. <laughs> so that has some positive, uh, we can see some positiveness in, uh, in this situation. Like uh, uh, there, there is a, um, Personality, a French personality, it's an engineer called Marc uh, Jancovici, who says that uh, actually we will need like uh, one new COVID uh, every year if we want to reach uh, the Paris in agreement. Uh, otherwise, we are going uh, to, to, the, to the hell of climate change. Yeah, um, <laughs> Sorry. That's really it, was, it was a bit gloomy, but uh, yeah, yeah um, I, 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 I would try to pull it a little bit more in a positive direction. And I, I think like, uh, first of all, like, I'm really grateful for having this uh, yeah. conversation with you. And I, I think it's really wonderful that we can actually share it to a broader audience as well. Um, I, I appreciate that. And maybe that's something that we can learn uh, when also when COVID stops and whatever, although it's nice to be in proximity and all that. Um, but I've been, I really appreciate that. And, and then I, um, I think what I really get from, from this conversation that we've had is that um, there, is, there is something with the decolonization of the mind uh, and how we need to change um, our behavior and our whole understanding of other species and ourselves and, and all that. And, which connects to a sort of structural problem, uh, which is everywhere and it connects everywhere. Um, all the, the, the problems and, and all that is connected to that somehow. And, and I think we have been touching on, on elements on it. Um, and if we were to have another conversation, maybe we can go more deeper into that somehow, which is also super hard because it's, a, it's, it's really like, how do you, how do you go about that? How do you really go about changing uh, the structural problems um, related to climate change? So, um, but I'm, yeah, I just want to thank you that uh, uh, about this conversation, it was really, uh, really wonderful and, and deeply inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> and one last sentence. 
Yes, uh, well, I was thinking like, uh, yes, there's a lot of doom and gloom uh, with Corona. Uh, my boyfriend was even a, a nightmare scenario, a long holder for eight months and completely gone. Uh, so yeah, I've had my fair share. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think it's also like, wow, if um, I think it showed the world very well uh, that there are non-human agencies that we should take very seriously. And uh, it also might help us uh, to reflect on where we are and where we want to go. So it's also a chance, I think. Fernando, do you want to have the last word? No? Then uh, I will say thank you to all of you so much. That's really um, been so inspiring to get an insight into all of your practices. Um, and I think really a, a rich uh, archive of uh, this conversation, which will be on YouTube um, after the live stream ends. Uh, I also wanted to say that Frame of Framed and Form Democracy is arranging a reading group that I think is also going to be online. So keep an eye on their social media. And then for sure, this uh, conversation will uh, continue as, as it must. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you to Frame and Frame and Poem Democracy for, uh, for inviting us and for arranging this. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers.